Good evening, everyone. Uh, before, before I uh, start with an introduction uh, of Kate Orff this evening, uh, I've been asked to remind you that anybody who wants continuing education credits for landscape architecture, there's a sign up at the back. Yes. <laughs> there you go. So it is, uh, it is really with great uh, pleasure that I'm able to welcome Kate Orff uh, I should say, back to UVA uh, School of Architecture as our Lillian Stone lecturer this evening. Uh, just to tell you a little bit about the lectureship, the Distinguished Lillian Stone lecture is hosted jointly by the Schools of Architecture and Law, and it's intended to fulfill the intellectual and educational commitments of the two schools by creating an opportunity for students to be educated in environmental study, policy, and design. The lectureship was uh, endowed in honor of Lillian K. Stone. She was a longtime influential senior staff member of the U.S. Department of the Interior and an early advocate for environmental impact assessments. Uh, she was the chief of the Energy Facilities Division and served as the principal advisor to bureaus on energy and environmental policy and legislation issues affecting natural resources. So I want to uh, first thank uh, the donors that have made this lectureship possible. Uh, alumni Thatcher Stone uh, and Frank Kittredge. Thatcher is an alumnus of the law school and uh, Frank uh, Kittredge of architecture uh, and they're the ones that have made this lectureship possible. Uh, the lecture tonight and the series of events that have been part of it is also co-sponsored by the Environmental Resilience Institute uh, which supports transdisciplinary research and I want to thank uh, Karen McG uh, McGlathery uh, who's here this evening for her support for this lecture. Thank you Karen. So this year's lecture, Kate told me not to, you know, give any long introduction. Uh, so I'll try not to, but, you know, Kate is uh, d doing some pretty amazing work. She's the founder of SCAPE, a landscape architecture studio that is very much committed to linking the creation of performative landscapes to larger ecological, social, and political agendas. SCAPE produces new prototypes for regenerative living infrastructures that we so desperately need, certainly within the context of global warming, environmental degradation, species loss, uh, that are simultaneously designed to become amazingly diverse public spaces that foster social life. In 2017, she was awarded the MacArthur Genius Foundation Genius Grant, significantly the first landscape architect ever to receive this very prestigious award and become a MacArthur Fellow. Yeah, you can come down. There's right in the front row here, you know. <laughs> You're like tiptoeing carefully, and then, of course, I tell everybody. Uh, National, National Geographic uh, ran a headline on Kate that uh, sums it up in my mind. Uh, they said, climate change breaks landscapes and Kate remakes them. Uh, through her firm, she's developed many compelling projects, uh, for example, partnering with the state of New York uh, to create living breakwaters along the south shore of Staten Island uh, that was devastated by Hurricane Sandy a project that has evolutionary ties to an earlier uh, project that she had done, her oyster texture project developed for the MoMA's Rising Currents uh, exhibition three, three years earlier. And these living reefs protect the coastline from future storms and erosion. They mitigate sea level rise while restoring marine habitats and their biodiversity. I think one of the things that's really Incredibly interesting, of course, is the overlay of ecological, social, political, and aesthetic agendas uh, within the context of research and experimentation. And I think this is evident, really, in every one of her projects, uh, such as her Balin's uh, project in San Francisco, where she asked the question, how do we make sediment public? Great question for every landscape architect. Uh, making clear that resilience only comes about when culture and nature are intimately interwoven and where landscape architecture emerges from design that works in concert with complex living processes. Kate was named a 2012 United States Artist uh, Fellow, an L Magazine Planet Fixer, I really like that one, uh, and shared SCAPE's design methodologies at the International TED Women uh, Conference in 2010. She's a designer, a researcher, a visionary, and an activist 
uh, her firm has won a number of honors and awards, and she's the author of Toward an Urban Ecology, a recent book on the firm. I'm also happy uh, to say uh, that Kate earned her undergraduate degree here at UVA, not in the architecture school, but in political and social thought uh, with distinction, and she received her MLA uh, from the GS Harvard GSD. She's also an associate professor at Columbia University and the director of their urban design program. So I know that was probably way too long, <laughs> Kate, and I'm sorry, but uh, please join me in welcoming Kate Orff. Thank you. That makes it easy. <laughs> Hi. Okay. Thank you so much, Ela. And all right, step aside. Um, I'm really happy to be here, and I want to thank Ela and Brad and and Ila. Sorry, Ila and Brad and um, Karen and the 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 group um, of this amazing faculty that are are here. Um, because um, it seems like there's just this great dynamism to the school, and it's just really exciting to see. Um, so I have prepared some remarks, and I, I guess before I begin, I just wanted to say it's a great honor to also be giving the Stone Lecture, and I've tried to prepare some remarks about the office that really begin to speak to um, policy and the interaction between policy and design. But don't go to sleep, because policy is also a big part of design. So in terms of advancing slides, I've got my thing here. So I am wanted to start also by just talking, having a little like walk down memory lane relative to University of Virginia for me. So <laughs> guess what? <laughs> in a you know rotten box, somewhat water destroyed box, I found my old um, thesis for that was called ecofeminism um, in the Department of Political and Social Thought. Could not find the grade, but this was just a copy. <laughs> Hopefully it was not a terrible grade. But um, I just sort of had this, you know, coming here brings a lot of memories back and you kind of think about the arc of your, your life and how long your life is and how ideas kind of um, have a sort of bubbling up at certain points and, and, and how really through the work of the office I actually feel like um, one of the strengths of the office is just kind of like holding on to ideas and testing them in multiple forms. So when I sort of saw this and I found this and I read my own bizarre text, which is like this is kind of, you know, was a, a way for me. So political and social thought is this interdisciplinary major. You kind of have to find your own in faculty. There's a, a seminar, but then I ended up being in um, the environmental sciences and studying with um, Dr. Odom, Dr. Shugart um, in anthropology, when women's studies, um, fine arts and sculpture, and kind of wove this weird process together of making my own major, all the while being a total A school groupie. So I was here checking out the parties, like, oh God, there's that you know dance that they have every year. And can I get to that dance? Do I have to be an A school student and so on? Just kind of like like developing a relationship for, into this school, but kind of as an outsider, someone who was very interested was going on. And so I started taking courses um, at the at the A school during this kind of process of trying to discover who am I, what am I interested in, and um, and got really excited. Ended up taking a course with Professor Reuben Rainey, um, who is, I think, still teaching history. But at that point, it was like landscape architecture survey course. Went into the course thinking it was one of these like art historical surveys, and then by about mid-November, was like, "Oh, I can do this! Like this is a thing that is a landscape architecture that you can do now as a person." And uh, you know, so I didn't come from a lot of money. I didn't come from any kind of you know place where one would even understand that landscape architecture really exists as a profession. So you know that was an exciting kind of just revelation for me. And so I, it's it's you know at, at UVA in the architecture school at that time I was able to see some great people. I saw um, Ian McCarg smoking a cigar and kind of I don't know if anyone was at that day just pacing the stage, <laughs> you know, and then like. <sighs> and like a big globe on the screen behind him and uh, being like, oh my God. And uh, so there was the Ian McCarg moment and, uh, you know, watching um, Carol Franklin I saw with uh, Andrew Pogan, a lot of glasses moving up and down, three pairs of glasses. And I was like, okay, so designers also do that. So I kind of feel like I'm a hybrid in that, in that realm of somebody who's trying to be aspirational, trying to look at big global issues, trying to write about issues. And I would encourage you to learn how to write and write well. And, and then going back and forth between the, like, the glasses and how hard it is to just sort of get things done on the ground, which all of you practicing architects know is, is the case. So 
So I think scape has sort of become a vehicle for these two modes of working. And, um, and I would encourage you that you, know, you don't have to make a choice uh, between those two modes of working. Um, this is our office in New York City. And um, we're landscape architects, a couple of architects, urban designers, mostly from the Columbia context, planners and, and horticulturalists. And this is the kind of cloud of amazing people. And I think it's important, you know, you know, having the MacArthur piece, I'm like, well, I'm kind of one of this network of people. I'm like a network mobilizer. So it's always, I think, interesting to sort of go back to this fact of teamwork and how teamwork is a great way to get things done. I also played lacrosse at the University of Virginia. And I used to kind of coach while I'm playing, right? Like, all right, you've got to plant your foot and then turn. Come around the goal, you know? And then, so I think this kind of notion of, um, peer-to-peer -peer coaching, or that's kind of how I work as a leader. I'm not hopefully somebody who's like this top-down person, and if you're not doing something to my, you know, way I think, that's not really how the SCAPE office works. It's really in this sort of cloud formation where different kind of degrees of talent sort of rise to the top and sort of people sort of take on tasks and, and excel in different streams. So I think that's a very important comment on, on, on how we work. It's this sort of a networked cloud, and I get to kind of sit on that cloud and, and enjoy <laughs> the fruits of everybody's labor. <laughs> so, <laughs> which is really true. So, but you know, I show that image of, of ecofeminism and this notion of you know what I was trying to aspire to communicate at that point, which is like grounding a kind of uh, an engaged politics within an environment and kind of becoming get, getting specific about that. So, you know, I think really this book, um, my toward an urban ecology book is just sort of like a next chapter to that realm of exploration. I think in that interim period, it was a great period of actually just heads down, learning what landscape architecture is, thinking about landscape architecture as and the tools of civil engineering and communications and some policy and advocacy and all these things, kind of sharpening all those tools all together um, and sort of folding that into the profession. And so I think the book is really trying to do that. And try to express this, how I see this sort of change. It's really a theory of change um, that's embedded in the book. So working in New York um, was very instructive for me. Uh, and my earliest, earliest essay in, say, 2005 was actually an essay on Jamaica Bay. I know if you're familiar with this landscape, it is a kind of low-lying tidal landscape um, near JFK Airport. That's how you might know it. <laughs> And um, literally, um, as I was beginning to research this book and this article, I just basically realized that these, these tidal wetlands are simply vanishing due to a whole host of interrelated factors. Excess nitrogen, sea level rise, da, da, da. Um, you know, you could sort of, and it's not just one isolated variable. So I kind of quickly began to look at this landscape in Jamaica Bay and realized that the powers at that time that I had been taught of landscape architecture, a bounded site, planting plan, blah, 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 have literally no bearing on this particular landscape, that it is vast and systemic. It's a political challenge. It exists, you know, in order to in intervene in the bay, you have to look upland and into the watershed. You have to engage people. You have to look at the level of power of the Army Corps, a very centralized power. So this image on the left is an image of Army Corps uh, uh, um, soil rebuilding, marsh rebuilding, marsh replenishment, and look at, at concepts on the right, which are um, localized, community-based actions. So to me, that was like an instructive way of looking at the world, of reimagining landscape, and it's sort of, I think, just a thread that has carried on throughout the practice, which is how to move beyond the kind of site-delimited boundary of the site that you are given to try to affect larger aspects of change. So it's not as simple as top-down, bottom-up, but there's a kind of concept that's embedded in there of systemic change, certain powers that be, and uh, community organization. So the basic thesis of the book is kind of how to overlay this notion of regenerative living infrastructure uh, with a unit of engaged citizenry and, and community that can then serve to become a change agent into the future. And so that basically sort of set me off on this trajectory of, of, um, of uh, ecosystem change and, and sort of landscape systems thinking. So the goal of the practice is always to generate ecosystems, to forge connections and, uh, between human and non-human species, as you can see on the right, uh, <laughs> horseshoe crabs. Embrace the physical reality of our landscapes, not to um, 
engage in a kind of a, po a false poetization of the actual physical and chemical um, reality of our urban landscapes, water quality, revive landscape systems. This is a project on the left that we're now engage, uh, working on in, in Lexington, Kentucky, where you can see here the boils, what they call the boils, where water bubbles up underneath a karst landscape, and on the left, the urban boils, which is literally a storm drain, which is going the opposite direction. So, you know, these notions of trying to look at a regional landscape and revive ecosystems, and always to think about each project as an experiment of X. Like, what are we learning? How do we kind of test the boundaries in this particular project? So experiment, and finally, to engage people. So as you'll see in the two projects that I'm gonna show, that's not only the design of the physical landscape, it's sort of the design of the engagement and communication process in order to build constituency. Because in order to change the landscape, people have to love it. And in order to steward that landscape, people have to care about it. So I wanted to just say, hey, we build projects, which is I never talk about all of these things that those people in the cloud are working on all the time, which are basic projects that I would say have different aspirations than the two that I'm gonna show you, which are more about um, uh, an influencing position. But we have started to develop a really exciting portfolio of built work of plazas. This is a plaza here in Washington, D.C. at the former Washington Post building. Um, it has detailing that has, um, you know, where you know, I saw the, um, some pinups upstairs where people talking about paths and textures and all these things. So all these things are super important to learn, super important to practice and think about as you practice as a landscape architect. Another view of the DC project. We do planting plans. I feel like there's this false dichotomy between, hey, you're like the systems landscape people over here, and then there are these other people who just do horticulture and materiality. It's so, we have to go so beyond that. And the favorite thing is to do a planting plan. We do these lush, rich planting plans. We do large, very small micro spaces. We do bigger plaza spaces um, on waterfronts and um, that involve kind of complex technical construction. So I just wanted to emphasize that it's not like a dualism that we're proposing here, which is that you can either think at a systems and planning level, at a policy level, versus a very small scale technical or detail level. Um, you can, that's a part of the joy, I think, of landscape is that you can kind of think about these things simultaneously and drop the, drop the wars in the profession. Um, but in addition to the construction aspect and building these projects, I'd also say it's incredibly important for um, landscape architects and architects to look deeply at places and landscapes and begin to tell stories. And so that was the, the goal of the Petrochemical America book of 2012. And that was a chance at sort of looking very closely at one place in the world, Cancer Alley, well, um, which is the, the zone between uh, Baton Rouge and New Orleans, and just to sort of look in a very deep way and think about the connections between things. Think about and tell the story of kind of America's obsession with oil and, and its sort of impacts on the landscape. Of course, those are almost impossible to kind of unpack right now, but through a series of drawings, and this was a work with the photographer Richard Mizrak, and the diagrams we began to try to unpack all these stories and show the complex interrelationships that landscapes have <laughs> and, and that these some decisions that might happen in an energy space might have profound and deep ex, um, impacts on, for example, entire bodies of water. So fast forwarding, you know, that was an image of two, uh, you know, sugar, um, uh, sugar cane plantation and a um, uh, nitrogen fertilizer uh, uh, factory in the background. But fast forward, those moments that are very uh, specific based on a ser series of decisions and uh, um, um, efficiency and uh, growth and productivity create an incredibly vast um, um, dead zone in uh, the entire Gulf of Mexico. So all of that fertilizer moves up and um, occupies the entire, um, essentially the sort of watershed of the Mississippi River, comes back down in the form of waste and creates a dead zone. So how can you think across scales, tell stories about landscape, and begin to think in a deeper way? Can we impact those scales at the scale of a project or a landscape architect with a piece of paper and an L dash sheet on your desk? Probably not. But you may be able to impact other um, conversations. And I think that's also something important to be aspiring to. So just telling that story of, of the death and the loss in this landscape became something important. And so this is a longer book. Here's another zoom into this is atrazine, 
and nitrogen um, and uh, the dead zone mapped here. So telling that story is, is an important part of, I think, what we do because um, as you're probably well aware, there's very segmented and siloed thinking across many sectors. And so the notion of the landscape architect or architect designer trying to pull those things together and understand and describe those interrelationships, no matter how complex, are important. So this image shows, for example, the, the claws foot, the Louisiana Delta, and the looped and living systems of oysters, crabs, um, uh, shellfish that once uh, uh, um, developed that as a robust economy, and then zooming in the sort of land loss that's expected due to um, this levy uh, dumping sediment off the Gulf, subsidence, sea level rise, et cetera. So even just sort of tying together these um, 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 two, two scales of, of impact is incredibly important. And I think with this particular Petrochemical America and the, the Venice Biennale project that we just um, showed uh, opened up in the spring, it's really trying to tell stories of loss. And, and in Venice, we tracked the loss of this particular um, ecosystem combined with five other uh, ecosystems around the globe uh, and began to um, uh, describe um, at a global scale the concept of the coastal squeeze, subs subsidence, uh, loss of wetlands, um, and so on. So I guess the meat of my talk is sort of now, which is that also <laughs> that, that I feel like between these two kind of scales, which is very immediate and direct based on constructing landscapes in the urban environment and describing wider complex ecosystemic relationships, is this middle scale, which I think is incredibly important, and that is this notion of design to influence policy. Often we're on the flip side of that equation in which designers are on the receiving end of a policy, and um, there are really incredibly important policies like uh, the ones that were described um, um, in terms of environmental regulations and so on, but often at a municipal scale, policy tends to break down, create uniform landscapes, that simply cannot sort of adapt to these new realities and changing climates, rising seas, et cetera. So I was going to try to cover four landscapes that do this, but I actually, just upstairs in Julie Bergman's office, cut two. <laughs> so we're just going to look at these two and, um, and see where we get to by um, in the next half an hour or so. But, but these are all projects in the office that I think try to work that middle scale of designing up and pushing against policy boundaries. Um, and within this kind of concept is incredibly important to look at the concept of infrastructure more broadly and to envision living infrastructure that now can adapt, grow, and change. So you saw that split screen before, right, of the marshland and the community and engaged community. So that um, essay and that sort of frame of mind took me directly into oyster texture, which is a 2009 project. And um, these are just two images from it, but it literally kind of performed, you know, provided this kind of template for thinking about um, this, how I would approach this project. And it was a bizarre situation where someone calls you and says, oh, well, we want to do this exhibit in the Museum of Modern Art about X. So, so it's important to like have that sort of thread in mind, and for me, it was a great way to sort of test that idea. So, for oyster texture, it was literally resulted in this um, community-driven uh, reef building project that was cleaning water, slowing down water offshore, and was um, fostered and uh, by onshore um, uh, um, communities, and. Um, and so then, then we had Sandy hit in, in the New York region. It was this kind of huge wake-up call. I want to say unexpected. There were weather reports, but like unexpected on a kind of massive paradigmatic scale. <laughs> and you know, um, so I think what was quite um, astonishing in this case was that all of a sudden, all of these projects that were hanging in the white walls of this exhibition all of a sudden became a template for describing a solution space or what do we do now. So it's a unique situation in which I think the, all the projects in that exhibit became a sort of framework that had set in people's mind thinking differently and tribute to the architects and landscape architects in that exhibit. Because after Sandy, there was this um, sense of, well, we're not just going to go and build a giant seawall, or of course that's still on the table right now, we're still kind of fighting that, but there was a sense of like, there is more than that. There's many other dimensions. There's a kind of 
a broader picture here that is more interconnected. And we can't just think about this as solving one problem because you're creating a whole host of other projects, problems. So um, Rebuild by Design was a, a kind of competition space that not unlike the MoMA had created a sort of free and open space that was inviting us to sort of come experiment and, and try to think differently about infrastructure. And it was important at the time because at a federal level, I'm sure anyone who deals with the federal government, basically disaster money, DR money, HUD funded money, comes in the form of building back what was there and not building back differently or better or with other new parameters, et cetera. So it actually to not do that is a huge policy change. And uh, Sean Donovan, who I just had speak in my class two weeks ago, was kind of talking about the inner machinations and lawyers that had to begin to interfere and intervene in that uh, tranche of funding that came to New York to enable a tiny little sliver to be uh, funding for pilots and testing of infrastructure that might adapt and, and, and be uh, held to different criteria. So we were selected for Rebuild by Design and um, not unlike the Oyster Texture Project aimed to advance this idea of living infrastructure and designing space for humans and non-humans alike um, in this era of climate change. So this is a view of the um, project, Living Breakwaters, which is about a 1.5 mile long stretch of um, these wave reducing structures. And um, um, this particular area, Tottenville, was hit really hard by Sandy with waves, knocking houses off of their foundation. And so um, after a very long kind of uh, project or uh, discovery period, and uh, we, we landed on uh, this project that was then awarded funding. So, and critical for this idea of resilience, relative to this project was not just to think about infrastructure as something that is physical, was to think about infrastructure as something that is jointly um, ec ecological, something that um, has risk reduction capacity and something that fosters social life on shore. So this became a kind of model for us. And it's important that it's not just like a diagram that's on this screen, which it is, I acknowledge that. Nevertheless, it also became a kind of a battle cry for our funding so, and, and to, to push the policy, right? So at every moment, and you'll probably experience this in the future or if you have not already, is that it's a fight, right, to sort of keep pieces of your project and keep everything moving forward. So at almost every station or every moment, they're like, you know, let's just cut down, cut out the school's program because, you know, we want to do this other thing. But you have to say, no, this entire project is testing a resilience concept that involves social, ecological risk reduction and to sort of keep all that moving forward. So yes, it is a diagram, but it also became kind of a template for responding to um, um, all these like things that chip away at, at your projects over time. Um, so at any rate, we started this you know, investigation at a very regional scale, looking at the regional landscape and understanding the kind of protective ecological infrastructure that exists and that is so um, endangered, that is so, you know, has such high protective benefit and began to sort of map and the salt marshes, shrublands, pans, subtidal reefs, and islands, beaches that, that actually pervert, perform this incredible service of, of sort of shoreline protection, coastal protection. We began to map these shallows and began to think about places where they could be built up and layered in. So rather than just produce one kind of singular element within that cross section, our goal was to kind of build this cultural resilience overlaying you know, aspects of ecological infrastructure together with the social life and social life on shore. So that the two together, where the project begets the social life and vice versa over time, creating, you know, I think in the Petrochemical America book, it's pretty clear you can see the cycle of extraction, waste landscapes, and uh, sort of environmental degradation that happens. But I think what we were trying to do with this project is to set in motion a different, um, a, a more regenerative kind of spiral. And it's really hard to do that. I would say that loss and landscape loss is something that is incredibly hard to fix, easy to, easy to disrupt, easy to destroy. So, so we began to study also zooming into Staten Island as a potential site, understanding the massive erosion. This used to be a street that is happening there um, that has been this kind of incremental uh, erosion loss that has become more and more rapid, how um, thinking about a singular fix, like just throwing in some trash ba trap bags, um, is not really a comprehensive way of thinking about shore the shoreline because it is a dynamic system 
this DPR came in and put those in, and then you know, two months later, they were completely eroded. So you know, this notion of kind of comprehensive thinking, thinking about how to rebuild a shoreline and um, uh, in a much more thick, layered way is incredibly important. Began to interact with communities, talk about these breakwaters, how um, they can reduce erosion, how they do not keep out flood water, and how that, that in, is, is a sort of a dynamic um, that um, we need to constantly address developed a, a sort of a cross-section with marine engineers and so on of a breakwater that has these little sort of reef street fingers in it that have high degrees of ecological value, especially for fin, fin show. In, or, in addition to the risk-reducing kind of qualities of a typical breakwater, it has this sort of ecological regenerative piece in which these subtital reef streets um, can uh, grow and foster um, spaces for a fish to hide. And, um, and also we are seeding these breakwaters with the New York Harbor School and the Billion Oyster Project so that the oysters themselves um, grow in and agglomerate over time. So it is a breakwater seeded by um, these schools. And so through our funding, and this was another big policy shift, which is Sandy DR money is not usually going toward social or schools programming like this, but in this case it was described as part of the total project approach. Um, um, schools at the waterfront can be participants in this kind of new um, um, engagement with the waterfront, increasing perception of risk, increasing kind of comfort with water, et cetera. So in this world, in this kind of post-disaster world, um, students teach the teachers. We had students from Governor's Island come in and do workshops with Staten Island science teachers. Um, we developed this oyster gardening manual that was going to be helping um, Teachers um, teach this program. Um, it's a state certified um, science program. Um, and folks from the office, this is NANS, and began, we began to pilot these oyster techniques to collect shells, get restaurants involved, develop middens, and now we have a kind of a you know, big oyster mound <laughs> and, and a bunch of really engaged um, eighth graders and, um, in Staten Island. Um, and that is sort of all part of the project. It's not just the physical structure. This is the Resilience Project. So um, from an implementation standpoint, I think a lot of times there's this notion of like, why are you guys involved in this? You know, it's like, well, we conceived of the whole thing. You know, so I think that the question is always, and I think architects and landscape architects in the rule have to always now be fighting for seat at the table. And because sometimes I say in a joking way, but I'm only half joking that I use the word resilience a lot because it means that it's not engineering, problem, problem solving. It's a much more comprehensive cultural project and so on. So um, yes, so design plays a huge role in this and we began to accelerate through a design process, through a kind of, this is a grasshopper script of beginning to test very quickly the size, the spacing, the crest height, the distance from shore, et cetera, integrating that with the GIS map, beginning to study modeling scenarios of how these physical elements might be arrayed in the landscape um, and how they um, result, what is the sort of um, uh, modeling result, how are they performing. Um, we've now done essentially a full CD set and we're going to be going in water with this system in next year, which is really exciting. But at the same time, as I mentioned, it's not just this test of a physical infrastructure, it's also now a test of large scale urban oyster restoration, which is very exciting because we have tiny plots up in Soundview and um, in Jamaica Bay with New York, New Jersey Baykeeper, the Billion Oyster Project, et cetera. But this is a scale that is massive. And so what's exciting, and, and this is another big challenge to everyone working in this space, is you might know the kind of extents of the system that you want to operate on, but the funding or other constraints mean that you have, um, uh, it can only implement a piece of that system. So um, where we are in Staten Island and how we got to that 60 million number, how we got to that reach um, of breakwaters was also this question of how can the t system be tested. So we felt like that basically was an, a way to test not only the social life on shore, the social aspect, the risk reduction aspect, and the ecological regeneration aspect. So this is some more about that. We also began to test this structure in an actual wave pool, which was really exciting up in Toronto or up in Ontario, rather, um, and develop the entire system as a pilot, uh, a, a large-scale pilot that is testing um, um, various kind of um, um, the efficacy of these different systems and these different um, in, um, 
um, intervention. So with full on control segments and uh, so on. So from a policy standpoint, so don't snooze off, but from a policy standpoint, I think that's another big aspect of all landscape architectures working in this sort of green infrastructure space or green blue infrastructure space, which is monitoring, right? So you have to not only, as a landscape architect, think about the project, design the project, you also have to come up with monitoring protocols and then help get that funded so that the thing can move forward. So a big thing, what we are doing now in Pippa Brashear and our office is really spearheading this, is developing a nationwide sort of NNBF monitoring protocol against which all new green blue infrastructure projects can kind of plug into. That is the foundation for new policy. Um, and so that's another push against that system. So I think I can sort of just keep going and, and we're kind of continuously moving on and working with this is Lemon Creek where we have some nurseries um, that the oysters are gonna be starting there and get some spat in the water before we get going. And I think what's um, fun is and exciting is that we're aiming to be in construction next year. And at the beginning of this process, it wasn't even clear that um, we would be involved in this phase. So I'm very excited about that. And that has a lot to do with just kind of grit and finding, forcing yourself to get a seat at the table. And so of course, this is our other alternative, right? So these are these different worlds that are now very much in a dialogue with each other. This is a proposal from some years back of just a harbor barrier. So, I mean, I think all of us have to now, I mean, I love the word planet fixer, but it's like crazy and that there's literally no fixing this planet. There are gonna only be hard decisions and harder decisions. So um, the, this debate is this kind of debate that it's important for all of us to sort of be involved in, I think, because you know the notion of um, maintaining the harbor as an active estuary, the important that importance of fish migration, fish passage, ecolot, you know, um, biodiversity um, in these spaces is something that um, everyone has to kind of have a say in. So there is no final answer to this question, but um, these are all the hard choices of who's inside and who's outside, uh, what is the nature of um, our relationship to the water, are still very live and very unsolved. Okay, so this last project or second project I'm gonna talk about is the Guanas Lowlands, and it's a very different scale of project. It's more of a neighborhood uh, plan, neighborhood scale response to um, high development pressure and changing climate and rising seas. And so um, in this particular case, we were looking at this notion of responsiveness and how if, if, if Living Breakwaters was aiming to kind of push up against federal HUD regulations, um, Army Corps regulations, trying to push state um, um, uh, habitat regulations and, and, and sort of local access laws. This one is really more about looking um, at the level of the city of the municipal law that really governs our waterfront. Because as you all know, basically any kind of project you're, you're printing out, you have your waterfront access plan guideline. You have your you know, selected species list. And, and in many ways, um, all of these amazing intentions of these sorts of planning documents actually translate into incredibly sterile, banal waterfronts. And this is my like most hated word in the world, passive. So, you know, let's just make some passive space. So, okay. And literally everything on the left is usually not um, enabled by these guidelines or restrictions, which of course are designed to try to bring people to the water. So I think we see this dialogue or this dynamic happening all the time in the New York context, and I can imagine it happening everywhere. While the best intentions of waterfront access result in, you know, Joe Boringsville. And everything that we actually want to be doing happens in these weird interstitial leftover spaces that are completely not able to be even built at this moment. So our challenge with the Gowanus was to, how do you not lose this, this kind of dynamism? And of course, you know, parks and landscapes are often governed by these kinds of thoughts, like hmm, large tree, passive recreation, um, X amount of lawn required. Um, but these are the realities that we find in our dynamic ecosystems, and especially in coastal concepts. So there's like no reciprocity there, and I don't think we have a kind of a clear set of way of thinking about all the challenges, spatial, three-dimensional habitat that, that we are um, now uh, facing. So, and you know, and here's what's happening now in the Gowanus Canal, 
and tip of the hat to Julie Bargman, who has kind of been a huge advocate for preserving and defending and advocating for these industrial landscapes, because this is basically how they change, right? On the left, you see a very typical, you know, upzoned building, a new uh, fully compliant shoreline public walkway, and you know, this is what this is what the challenges are of the future: is that sea level rise is happening. We're not keeping up with that. Um, development is happening. Every parcel along the Gowanus waterfront has been purchased and has flipped. So there is a <laughs> group of, of investors waiting to uh, flip these properties. And all of this is, is sort of at stake. So I think where we were trying to find ourselves is in the middle of this conversation, which is, OK, how can we try to get in front of this change process that is happening? These parcels will flip and be redeveloped in, in the next you know, five, five to 10 years. But how can we avoid the increasingly sterile and non-engaging waterfront that uh, could be um, down, coming down the, the, the pike? And so, you know, and then also how can you kind of preserve some of these exciting features of what is there? And I think as we've all learned, like even to in intervene in an industrial landscape, that involves dredging, it involves moving soil. It, it, you, you literally have to kind of remake it while you're making it. But how can we kind of pull all the aspects that, that we love about the Gowanus forward? So we engage in this much longer discussion now with city planning about this as a waterfront access plan and um, are now testing and arguing and trying to push the boundaries. And I was just now appointed to the mayor's waterfront advisory board. So I'm going to raise a squawk there um, <laughs> about why is the subtitle vegetation not counting? You know, like all of these metrics, which are, again, met with the best policy and planning intention. Um, and how can these um, existing policies that obviously need to exist, um, uh, how can we kind of begin to modify them to acknowledge stepping down these edges. In this era of biological annihilation, every kind of square foot of subtitle landscapes is going to be key to kind of build a bridge for species to kind of exist. Um, and so all of these kind of pressures on our policy and on our planning um, result in um, some bad decisions. So, and this is. The default scenario, everyone knows what this is, right? Just a vertical sheet pile bulkhead. But where's the social space there? Where's the community space? Where is the, you know, where's the habitat? <laughs> and I think that was another, there are a lot of sort of moments that stick with you, but one early moment on the, the Gowanus that sticks with me is I showed you the horse, horseshoe crab earlier, like literally a horseshoe crab just kind of like bumping up against one of these walls and not um, being able to have that kind of gradient of, of space to. To, uh, to move. So you kind of see these things and look through the eyes of the species, and that's kind of a scape uh, method, <laughs> is understanding uh, landscapes through the lens of, of species, and, 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 and you will design differently. So just to kind of keep going, you know, clearly not suitable for coastal species, requires a low gradient slope, seawall, requires tidal inundation. So all of these now, this is now the frontier, right, of, 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 of design, and and change um, are these waterfront edges. So we need to be able to use design as a challenge and a push against our existing um, uh, um, frameworks. So I'm just going to go through this pretty quickly, and then we'll just have some, some questions. But this is the bigger kind of concept of the plan for the Gowanus Lowlands, and it's really initiative of the Gowanus Canal Conservancy, which is a community-based group. And uh, they had the Gowanus Canal Conservancy had this, had this idea, really, which is how can we devise a plan that is proactive and anticipatory of all the development that is going to happen now? How can we get in front of that? How can we change our own mission from being um, an, a, um, um, uh, a, an organization that's like organizing small planting events to something that is literally serving almost in the same capacity as Central Park Conservancy serves for Central Park, that is monitoring management maintenance. But it's incredibly difficult because you're literally retrofitting a park, if you will, onto an urban fabric. There's no rectangular boundary that's going to that's gonna work that. So it's a huge experiment. I think it's totally exciting and like a model for thinking about this notion of, of retrofitting. So this is the old path of the Gowanus. Um, the shoals and shallows that used to characterize Red Hook and so on. And of course, everyone knows the story, because this happened all over the American landscape 
which is simply that because of our economic change, and you can see development happened in the high ground, um, probably oysters and um, were cultivated in the low ground, that this became a highly industrialized canal, straightened for barge traffic and for industrial um, production. And so, you know, this is the landscape that we find ourselves in now, which is this mostly post-industrial landscape that has fragments and relics of this past, mostly abandoned, in this case taken over and sometimes by artists or other sort of smaller scale industry, and it's just this landscape that's highly in transition. Um, but we have these extremely beautiful moments like I showed you before. This is an example of one of the canal conservancies um, uh, volunteer projects like to make little bee boxes and on the left hand you see what's to come. So we were trying to kind of break down this, this dialogue and, 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 and try to weave a path forward that anticipates change, that acknowledges the change that's about to hit the canal, that is um, built from a kind of a community driven uh, process that has a lot of input um, but that also is driven by developer dollars and um, so that is a very hard thing to do. But our goal was to get in front of that process and develop this anticipatory landscape that um, um, ties the entire plan together and then also provides a boundary or an edge for the Gowanus Canal Conservancy to begin to begin to manage this place as a park, not as a series of tall buildings with residual uncoordinated landscapes all around them, which is what is happening. So these are the components of our approach, which is a cleaner urban ecosystem, a community connector, a network of parks, and a wild urban waterway, and how to maintain um, those four aspects of the plan. You probably recognize this figure. This is exactly the figure of that historic uh, pattern overlaid on today's Gowanus, and uh, what it used to be, and this was the, in, the sort of inspiration for the, the title, the Gowanus Lowlands, because not unsurprisingly, that all of this area is now flooding. We had a big reveal party in a building over here, two inches of water on the floor during this, you know, posters light up and, and, it, and, and it subsided by um, evening time, but everyone was walking around in their high heels like, oh, geez, you know. <laughs> so this is happening now. It's not a future condition. It's not a abstraction. It is a experience that is happening now in the Gowanus and, and, and those these floods are becoming more and more frequent. And so how do we begin to design for that? Overlaid on top of that, we have pollution and um, the, the, the Superfund dredging that's happening now. So anyway, as part of that wild urban waterway and as part of that a cleaner, a cleaner canal, we're trying to work in, in a lot of different ways and a lot of different layers. So just with stream dilating, beginning to develop stormwater streets, work with DEP on retention tanks. Um, from a community standpoint, acknowledging the like fun, weirdness, and just incredible mixing that happens in this neighborhood. Um, and acknowledge that adjacency with what are, in some cases, functioning and working industrial landscapes. So um, this is an IBZ, which industrial business zone, kind of protecting that zone and enabling it to continue, not trying to gentrify the entire waterfront. And so our plans basically um, try to develop uh, from an urban design perspective um, and, and from a landscape perspective, these connective spaces. And, and in addition to connecting, try to preserve all of these kind of tiny, quirky, um, smaller spaces that characterize the existing canal landscape and all of the sort of fun um, just moments of discovery uh, that you see and the experiments that are happening there. Um, and so to design for diversity um, and, and to design for all of this kind of combination of social and life kind of coming together around this. So as part of this plan and, and I think what's, what's happening now is we have CDs on our desk and I'm not allowed to show these CDs because this is developer property, but what was important is that we started to develop in this planning stage, which I can share, a um, series of different edge typologies and edge treatments that we could begin to open that dialogue with at city planning to try to diversify these treatment edges. So we began to change this typology from more business as usual to um, cutting in, stacking, um, laying back, and um, this has become the sort of you know, a sort of a uh, organizational starting point for what is now formed as a developer consortium. So you have, <laughs> have these two things in dialogue, but that's pretty exciting, I think, actually, because the developers working together and, uh, you know, agreeing to um, a more comprehensive plan, getting, frankly, more density, but 
paying into a larger comp comprehensive landscape and uh, the Gowanus Canal Conservancy mobilizing to begin to monitor and maintain this par park is probably the best case scenario. Otherwise, we have piecemeal development, people getting uh, flooded out in the back, and this kind of generic landscape. So this is sort of where we, 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 we got to with the project in the planning phase. And it, it shows the sort of opportunities for ecological restoration, subtitle, um, grass planting, and so on, but also the kind of uh, continuation of what is, at, at that point, was a, um, you know, an industrial landscape that is a working landscape. So this is my last slide, and I wanted to uh, talk about policy on this slide because I think I showed in the, the Breakwaters project, right, at, at any moment, um, defining, you know, and this is one of the things that I love so much about landscape architecture and being a designer in the public realm is that all projects have a plan and a section. You know, they, they, are, they are kind of tools or vectors for starting conversations because they are, you know, they, they invite critique, they invite response, uh, but they nevertheless kind of place a change process and push that forward. So what's very exciting is that, you know, even though I've described probably to uh, too much detail the, the boundaries, the barriers uh, to all this kind of regulatory and planning context that we anticipate or that we encounter in our, in our work, but I think that's also the change process, right? And, and so if you don't start to engage, and even just one of these drawings, just and you know, I'm sure you do a million of these drawings as students, right? Like a little thumbnail, and kind of put it on the page. Even just unpacking this tiny little thumbnail and understanding what it would take to actually implement a landscape that is non-standard, that includes space for subtitle landscapes, that includes waterfront access, et cetera. You are literally dealing with all of these different entities, the state, fish and wildlife stories for potentially responsible parties, um, New York City, DCP and DPR, landowners, park maintainers, et cetera, DOT, DEP, this is our water board and our, our transportation board for any street end uh, change. And also uh, the sort of USC, you know, as mentioned that, USC EPA land owners. So I think, you know, to me that's the, the promise of design and also the, the kind of landscape that we need to now actively um, push against or, or become fully kind of engaged in in order to be able to make um, landscapes uh, in the future that are not just sort of um, carbon copies or results of policy that in itself is trying desperately to keep up uh, but that actually can serve as a force for, for change. And so um, I think this is my last slide, but um, that's one way that I would encourage you to think about policy and design and that we can use form, we can use the sort of um, concreteness, if you will, of landscape architecture in terms of its um, spatial um, precision, uh, but that always we can kind of use design as a, as a tool to influence policy. Thanks. I'm happy to take a few questions. Um, you know, I think a lot of people here are probably architecture students. Uh, not that it's totally different from landscape, but one thing that, you know, we perennially deal with is the issue of the discipline and disciplinarity. Um, and, you know, some architects are all for interdisciplinary. And sitting on the outside, it seems that your work, not just as landscape architects, but specifically at SCAPE, is kind of in, uh, intrinsically interdisciplinary. Um, would you agree with that? And what do you think that that kind of means for architects that we usually sit back and really let policy happen to us and we don't necessarily sit at the table? Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, that's an interesting question. And I, I guess it's fun to have that question at UVA, which I think other people look to and be like, wow, they are really interdisciplinary <laughs> in terms of your kind of joint programs between architecture and landscape and, and so on. And um, I mean, in my mind, I guess I try to hint at that a little bit in the talk, but it's, it's not just that we have to think about architecture and landscape. It's like, okay, we, we just definitely need to do that now. But what we really need to do is go from that sort of position of, of design and start to bridge with 
engineering or have a dialogue with engineering, have a dialogue with the, the sort of policy and planning, if you will, and um, and yeah, and 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 sort of get out of the the, the sort of shell. Of, I mean, not to say that we're in a shell, but get out of that kind of you know um, echo chamber of um, speaking to each other, which we're all trying to do all the time anyway. I feel like I was pretty lucky. I didn't talk about Columbia very much, but as in in that particular situation, I feel like I strangely via osmosis learned quite a bit by being a little bit of a fish out of water in that scenario, being someone who is focused on landscape and talking about, you know, field grass and, or, you know, whatever it is that there was like, what is that person talking about? But within a, an environment that is largely an architectural environment and uh, or people who are practicing architecture. So um, I, I, I do feel like in a strange way, it was kind of a training for um, needing to speak more broadly and, and being able to try to communicate um, the landscape outside of our, our field, per se. I don't think I answered your question about interdisciplinary, but it's a good question. <laughs> Maybe someone else can chime in. Anything else? Or? Um, there's such an, or there has been such an emphasis over the last 10 or 20 years on the use of native plants and their regenerative capabilities and really disturbed landscapes. But I think a lot of us are finding that in urban areas and other really disturbed areas that native plants in their home ecosystems are not working the way they used to and in this, uh, you know, the new climate. Mm -hmm. And so I was wondering what your philosophy is about the use of native mm -hmm. plants and if you find yourself bumping up against those policies that require them in landscapes where they may not actually thrive? I, that is a, a great question. I think it's not only native plants in terms of their aesthetic, right? It's also that in a funny way, you know, in the case of Piedmont in, in New York, at during Superstorm Sandy, there was a particular piece of, of, of Piedmont that was actually protected by this like massive mat of a Phragmites marsh. So it's also like your goals, you know, and, and the goals are never, it's never some like, oh, kumbaya moment where everything just kind of works out. So, you know, there was a group, um, and that's a, it's a very interesting case study because there was a group of, of residents um, of, of that um, town who, you know, were maybe in their 60s and 70s who had remembered the marsh in its former state of kind of cord grass and this and that. And so they were very, they're advocating like, let's restore the marsh. And, um, but, you know, they learned through that process that actually you need to get glyphosate and Roundup and you've got to cut it down and then you have this incredible um, process because it's, the water regime is highly, highly disturbed. So it's not like you can just replant something without changing that whole water regime or actually wholly removing that root system via a very difficult chemical. So it exposed this kind of generational gap there where um, the sort of younger families were like, no, no, we want the marsh. We want that Phragmites everywhere, you know, because it's going to protect us and uh, versus this kind of other view. So it's so revealing as to how you look at a landscape, whether or not you <laughs> and what your needs are, what your goals are coming out of that. And at SCAPE, we, we had that in a very direct way where we did a um, uh, project in Sag Harbor out on a peninsula and in a similar context. There's a plant list that we were given, like, here's the plant list. And the entire peninsula was taken over by Ilanthus, Phragmites, and, you know, uh, Japanese um, honeysuckle, or, sorry, wisteria. So I'd be walking along the beach and see, like, a wisteria bloom. Like, what is that? And it's, it's a wisteria plant that gone under the sand 40 feet. And, and so, you know, that was this radical kind of, thing where it's like, okay, well, I need to use native plants here. So it was a huge total unmaking and remaking. And, and um, in that case, the Phragmites is just this crazy management problem where you're trying to keep the, you know, it, it becomes not a design, but it's some kind of like crazy management regime. So um, in terms of our particular work, like on the Gowanus in particular, our, our goal is like, hey, we're not going to go in and put like linden trees. <laughs> we also have to change the New York, you know, it's these kind of banal, not banal, sorry, shade trees, very classic shade trees. It's like, no, we want poplar thickets. We want, you know, and how can you, we want, you know, willow thickets. And even those kinds of very basic, as I'm sure everyone has, you know, experienced, 
those basic concepts are extremely hard to implement because there are regulations that say you need to put your trees 25 feet apart. So there's a lot of like back and forth that has to go into that. But um, but yeah, that's that's my experience in that context. Thank you very much uh, for your presentation. I came here today from a background in the humanities and the arts. Um, so I observe that your plans are aesthetically beautiful just to look at. Um, and you've also done work with the Museum of Modern Art uh, and with the Venice Biennale. And so I have a two-part question for you. Uh, the first is, do you consider the work that you do to be art in some form? Um, and a second kind of follow-up question is, what do you think the role of the arts broadly conceived is in the kind of resilience um, and intersections of policy and environmental science uh, and activism? I, I think I, I, I love the question about art because I, I definitely think, you know, sometimes when I interface with artists who are working at a much more smaller scale, um, there are those tensions of like, okay, well, we're doing that with people, with things, and with the complexity of like legal restraints and not like, I had this idea and I put it over here. Not saying that that's what art is at all. But I, I do feel like there are those moments where <laughs> there's this notion of a, a, an art that is looking at and engaging with um, factors that are beyond the artist's imagination that to me are the exciting pieces or aspects of, of art. Um, and that doesn't say that you know a painter isn't a brilliant painter or what whatnot. But I guess um, in a way it's trying to set up a situation that is um, that is a change <laughs> a changed situation that I think was was what was fascinating. This is probably where our, our drawings took this crazy right turn. Was after the Museum of Modern Art and Barry Bergdahl was the curator. And I was there, I'm like, oh, blah, 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 I'm going to do this Gowanus, then I'm going to have this handbook about water use. And he was like, Kate, this is the Museum of Modern Art, you're going to put a handbook. And I was like, okay, all right, I get it. <laughs> I get it. I'm not going to do a handbook. Because normally that's like, okay, yeah, let's just figure this out and just do the right thing. But we made this kind of huge swerve where I was like, okay, I'm doing the grandma test, I'm doing the 20-foot test. Grandma from 20 feet away has to get the project right now. So that's, that's been sort of how we've started to... <laughs> change our, um, our, our sort of graphic approach. And so I would love to think of it as art in the sense that it's a sort of creative I impact on the, on the, in, the, in the environment. Um, I forgot the second one, but what was the, what was the second? Uh, address it, right. Well, in the case of the, the petrochemical book, Richard Miserak had photographed that Cancer Alley landscape in 90, actually, when I was in graduate school, so 96, 97. And then we came to, together much later in 20, 2012. And I think people like Richard are just super important as, and um, in, in who, who actually, as artists, do play a role in changing perceptions and expanding the space of possibility for, um, for a lot of us. And um, so his photographs, I think, are always um, very honest. It's like from two feet on the ground, not aestheticizing disaster or anything. He's like standing, looking. And um, I think, you know, work like that is incredibly important to just um, um, change that perception. It's, that's, I think, partly our role. And partly the role of these drawings is to convince, right? Because <laughs> you're usually dealing with um, a status quo is the best um, possible outcome conditions. So. Drawings also need to convey and seduce, um, obviously. Um. Uh, I? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for giving me this place and for giving me some wonderful discussion. I, I'm truly looking forward to see everyone who is at the bilingual field. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so I was very interested in the diagram where you had culture and pink and then um, mm -hmm. security, safety, and ecology. So yeah. that was basically the, your interpretation of sustainability and really focusing on it has to stand on its three pillars and that this is also um, its, its advantage when it comes to resilience because otherwise it will always break down and you really need the support from the community as well as from the political mm -hmm. side. Um, I find this is a super interesting 
agenda also to, you know, I was I had a look at the OISO project in relationship to the school component because mm -hmm. that also basically brings in a new generation that has a feeling and has an agenda and an agency. And at the end of the day, all of this will be a political discussion at the end of the day. And the more people are involved, the more political support a project can get when it comes to the realization later on. But I was also wondering if replication is maybe a part of this mapping. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Because in the moment when you can say, well, that's a project in New York, but mm -hmm. at the end of the day, we have to f operate very fast mm -hmm, everywhere. Mm -hmm. And it's a kind of orchestration of multiple forces who can come together and maybe through a choreography can replicate this in other communities and maybe in other sites you have less problems with the policies because it's informal anyhow. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering if you are also thinking about a hidden model that lives behind a project like this that can be replicated somewhere else with other communities in other sites and in other political contexts. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, I guess that that <coughs> drawing specifically has like no site, you know, behind it. And, you know, in, in some case, and I totally agree that it's a generational mapping on that, on top of the project, um, that, you know, I, I definitely feel like, um, um, you know, that, that notion of the model that was even in the, the Jamaica Bay Army Corps American Littoral Society volunteers juxtaposing is something that is replicable. I really think it is. And I, you know, I think, um, you know, moving into this sort of era that we're moving into that, all of these landscapes are actually in this potential period of extreme loss, and that's what the public sediment project that I didn't show, but is, is also getting at, which is how do you um, develop a constituency around something as abstract as sediment or land rebuilding or marsh rebuilding? Um, and um, so it's a, it's a similar, to your point, it's kind of um, uh, approach, it's more of an approach that, that we're trying to test out on different sites, and obviously it's not a one-to-one -one <laughs> um, replication of that, but it's kind of trying to look at how you can build a constituency through a project, and then the project then kind of comes in and becomes this like longer um, steward. Um, so, and that's the chance, and I, I think the other challenging thing is, you know, there's no like government thing that's just gonna happen. <laughs> and there's, you know, there's not, there's the level of the individual that change like we can all do, drive less, turn off the lights, you know, stop eating meat, et cetera, et cetera. Like these are all individual choices. But I find that middle scale of physical landscape that we're trying to de define and middle scale of these smaller community-based organizations where people come together of their own volition based on shared interest is a very powerful juxtaposition. Uh, I have a question. So I'm an architecture student, so um, this is relatively new to me, but I kind of picked up on two points that you raised that seem to be slightly in contradiction. So one was about how you talked about including the perspective of other species. And of which? Of including the perspective of other species. Other species. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the second was the idea that every project has to include the community and people. So mm -hmm. do you find cases where these are like sort of opposing forces, and my question is that are there certain projects where you'd rather keep the humans out and <laughs> not have an anthropocentric approach? Yes. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, I, yes, I mean, I, I definitely feel like, so just one example of that too um, um, is, is the, well, there's one example which is literally the Oyster Project, right? So I, we were having, talking this morning um, at the Resilience Institute uh, here and um, where um, they're doing some amazing work at this field station and in a very, very rural, if not totally kind of quasi-natural position. What I showed you is in a city of eight to nine million people. <laughs> and um, in those conditions, yeah, I mean, there are direct conflicts. And I think that's something that I, sometimes I try to like push things forward, like win, 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 win. It's never that. There's always like conflict, conflict, conflict. And um, <laughs> choices, choices. And um, so in that case, um, we had to devote a, a chunk of our budget to the active monitoring of this reef um, to keep people from taking, because it's um, not sort of, sorry, to go down the, the oyster craziness, but it's not certified water, so you cannot eat a water, uh, eat an oyster grown in uh, New York City waters. 
And um, so a huge effort now has to go into monitoring and keeping people out and, and not able to kind of uh, take an oyster out of the water. So, so that's like this whole thing where it's like, well, let's just make it so <laughs> it's, it, there's nothing easy about, about that. But that is a situation where there are always interspecies conflicts. Um, but I think, you know, in this set, public sediment project, which is up here, I think what we were trying to do is literally, in this case, understand a system through a species and then try to build a constituency for people uh, uh, for, for animals and a, uh, for sediment and a constituency uh, of people that tie into and, and, and to use the species in a very specific way to, under, you know, help connect people in a position of active caring, frankly, for that landscape where it might just feel like an open ditch in another case. So in this case, our goal was to bring fish and people and sediment and, and what's good for fish is good for people because it means access. It means that the banks are laid out lower. It means you can get there. So in that case, we were trying to show the reciprocity between what's good is for fish is what is, is what is good for people. Oysters, not so much. This is just an example. I'm sorry to, but this is a funny example of, you know, the steelhead, which was once this highly abundant fish in um, the, um, in the Bay Area. And, and literally now because of a series of dams and the canalization, the shallowness of the water, the heat of the water, almost gone, you know, in this, in this situation. And so this is an example of a tank of water and literally the volunteers, the friends of Alameda Creek, take a net, they take the steelhead out of the water, put it in a tank like this, and they drive it up to the spawning grounds because there were nine fish last time. So I think, you know, what, what we try to say is that it's not an either or. Um, obviously, Bengal tiger, your child, different situation. But, um, but in this case, I think um, we're trying to find those, those ways to um, reintroduce, frankly, species into the world <laughs> where possible. Yeah, that was a fantastic talk, Kate. Um, what I loved about it was the deep integration across so many disciplines. Um, and this morning when you were talking to people, they really resonated with a lot of work that you've been doing. So I asked a question as an environmental scientist now. Um, we're seeing with Hurricane Florence and also Hurricane Harvey, we're seeing new kinds of hurricanes happening with climate change, mm -hmm. ones that hold more water and stall on the landscape for longer periods of time. So, you know, I would love to see a different categorization of storms, you know, that's mm -hmm. it's water as well as force of impact of waves. Not just water from the ocean, but water from the watershed mm -hmm. and I know you talk about the watershed but are you, are you all thinking about that in any way I mean I feel like it's sort of our new normal now and, mm -hmm. and I think we're starting to think about that I'm not sure we know how to but I wonder if you're doing the same well one thing that that definitely came out of Florence was this sense that it's not a coastal phenomenon only that it was just this massive rain event that these channels were really kind of blown out and um, and you know the, you know, this notion of like, oh, we have to have one parking space per resident in every apartment. Like there are all these things that are actually driving just this um, increasing kind of lack of porosity in the ground plane. So, you know, this goes to, you know, a broader point about unmaking as a creative act because we called this project Unlock Alameda Creek and it was the, the idea of kind of changing the stream channel literally from something that's uh, deep and uh, kind of thought about as water conveyance to something that's more absorptive, <laughs> wider, and um, that slows that water down. So, but what's crazy is this is its own crazy policy change, which is that literally to move from um, this condition from a flood control channel to um, a wider, um, uh, different cross section is a whole series of, of meetings and Army Corps discussions and. Um, County Flood Control Board. So I think we have a lot of work to do in terms of undoing um, many of the mistakes that we have made, frankly, in the last years. And so that's at more of a micro scale. But the other way to think about it is just purely from this broad uh, surface standpoint of simply, you know, having a land policy in the United States that would mean that you can develop here, you can't develop here. <laughs> Things that, you know, Ian McCarg and Ann Spurn and, and others were talking about for for many years and those, that advice has not necessarily been heeded. 
sure. <laughs> Thank you so much. I really enjoyed your talk. Um, I'm so excited by this idea of design to influence policy. Um, and I was wondering if you could, I know there are some projects you didn't get to, but if you could um, maybe talk a little bit about if you feel like you've made any ground in pushing back on some of the policies that shape the way our landscape looks and, and performs today. Um, and is, is, I'm also curious, like what happens after you're, you're done with the project? Mm -hmm. uh, is, is, there, is that when you go and write about the successes or what worked and didn't work or, or advocate for a new project? Um, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. curious about that. Well, Brian, Brian Davis wrote an essay in um, the Tordner Ridicology book that was like, escape project is simply a program for more work. <laughs> so like there's no end, but, um, but of course there are ends to things and, and you know, um, these are still these kind of latent um, kind of becomings of, of projects. So, um, but I guess the, the point of them is they're just how they're trying to not be very bounded and by site boundaries that they're supposedly not bounded by like a time constraint or time either. So that would be a goal and I don't know if we're ever going to be able to to achieve that. Um, and in terms of the, the policy discussion, I do feel like in an exciting way that we've made quite a bit of headway in the New York context where I mentioned being on the Waterfront Advisory Board. They're going to set out a new, um, every 20 years it's law that a new waterfront plan is put out. And so, um, so I do feel like, and, and city planning has been incredibly open, kind of like, what should we be doing? Which is a great question to be asking. Um, and so if you're there with like, here's what it would mean, here's what it means to include subtitle vegetation in your vegetation requirements, or intertidal vegetation, or here's what it would mean to enable a bulkhead to step down and still meet the flood requirements, et cetera. Um, so, so I feel like in that, in that case, we're, our, we're making headway. And the most difficult part of that is like changing the calculus of that vertical bulkhead, which is the cheapest, fastest, least interesting thing that everyone will immediately go to and default. So how do you make that not the, the default is another thing. How does that become not the starting point? Um, so, um, but I feel like we're making a lot of headway in that particular area and that 10 years from now that there's going to be some new factors factored into that, which will hopefully have a big multiplying effect. Hello, thank you, uh, thank you very much for your talk. Um, kind of building off of that, I was very interested in your description of these projects being couched, at least internally to the firm. Um, as experiments. I was wondering if one, that that perspective allows you, you feel like to come back afterwards and keep, as you're like maintaining and collecting information, if that allows you then to push that into the next project. And two, um, if that's a mindset that you kind of let leave your internal discussions and that you share with clients or share with others, or if that's something <laughs> You keep on the on the lockdown on the as you try to yeah, <laughs> as you try to share a, a solution. Yeah, I mean, I, I was actually talking to the lunch editors and students about this a little bit, and with this notion of calling something as an experiment means trying to advocate that there is space for failure, and failure is part of that process. It sounds like very touchy feeling, but that failure is learning, and failure is a result. And that's not necessarily the worst possible outcome. The worst possible outcome is not kind of advancing and understanding what the results are. And so, and in those in those cases, yeah, I mean, I definitely feel like um, we are um, um, trying to 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 push that notion of the experiment forward and to push, you know, from the the moment of the the oyster texture project, that was kind of this funny moment where we were still pulling threads of it forward, but then it was like okay, well, let's ask questions of that project. Like, how does it perform as infrastructure? I don't know, we would have to model it. So we developed this relationship with Dr. Philip Orton of the Stevens Institute, and he started this, model. we started this dialogue about modeling, and that worked in Jamaica Bay and in other places. And so 
well, could they actually grow? And then so New York, New Jersey Baykeeper has done all these pilots. And so we're kind of like paying attention to how their pilots have been turning out and feeding that information kind of back into the project. And what about the water quality? So, you know, there's all, all sorts of ways of just at least thinking about them as experimentation, but also thinking about them as like able to receive lots of inputs. Um, and uh, in terms of sharing with the client in the, in the breakwaters case, yeah, we were like, we are designing this as a pilot. And that is also kind of how it got through this regulatory thing, because it's a very big pilot, <laughs> which is good, because <laughs> normally pilots are small, but we're like, it's a big pilot. It's almost like a project, but from a regulatory standpoint, it's still a pilot. Um, and, uh, and, and, and so that's why all the crest heights are different, and the slopes are different, and we have kind of different um, controls and tests on those, those pieces. So our client is very aware, like Gozer, the governor's office, is very aware of all those variables and that some of these breakwaters are going like, to be overrun by algae. There might be others that are super functional and you know, thriving with, with oysters. Some might work better as fish. You know, so there's going to be a lot of varied outcomes. So I think that's, that's part of that mentality is just feeling that sense of openness and risk and, and having a client that's able to work at that level and understand those risks, per se. Yeah. This is fun. We should end questions the whole time. <laughs> I love the question, and I think, you know, I was trying to kind of, you know, make some hints in that direction where I feel like there's been all of this, like, strange artificial separation in the field of, like, oh, well, you need to be doing these illustrator regional diagrams, otherwise you're not a rigorous landscape urbanist thinker. And there's this other group of people who are like, look at the stone. It's so, <laughs> like, and walking, and like, the texture. And I love both of those modes of practicing. And, and so all I would say is, like, can we just drop all that mumbo jumbo and just kind of acknowledge that there are different ways of scaling, you know, and thinking about a landscape that are deeply relevant at different scales? And so I have a feeling like Brad is already post, post, post all of those conversations and like pushing it off in a new direction. Um, and um, so I think just this kind of, I felt like I was strangely lucky to um, be at the GSD at this period where. There wasn't this kind of like ideological thing where if like you didn't make a project that looked like your instructor's idea of what the project would look like, that that was, it was okay. <laughs> and, um, you know, and it was, we had Michael Van Valkenburg as a chair and then Hargraves as a chair, but there wasn't this sense of like, you're going to be doing it like this, or I, at least I did not feel that pressure at the time. So to me, that's also needs to like totally loosen up and, and, you know, you know, make space for this sort of difference and uh, within the program, and and um, you know, combining this sort of sense of strong spatial planted form, landscape form, horticulture, and all those things that you need to do, and with this notion of urban design, I think is another big lift. And and I think that you know, all of us, there's cities around the world that are saying, oh, you know, we need help thinking about what our city's going to be in 20 years. And it's not an abstraction. It's it's literally this network of, you know, networks of cities, cities north of Virginia or out around the world who are literally going to need help thinking through all these sort of climate adaptation concepts and how they physically manifest in their cities, whether that's developing a complex and thorny roadmap for a retreat scenario or developing a park or whatever it is. So I would just say also that that, that is another kind of critical skill set, which is to toggle back and forth between the concept of landscape architecture and the city, you know, or the larger territory and being able to sort of feel fluid and comfortable with that relationship. So, thanks, Sarah. Okay. <laughs>